legers, economen en beleidsmakers denken dagelijks na over de vraag hoe we innovatie en economische groei kunnen stimuleren. Daarbij kijken ze vooral naar het bedrijfsleven en hoe we dat kunnen aansporen om meer en betere technologie te ontwikkelen. Maar volgens econoom Mariana Matsukato is het hele idee dat nieuwe technologie van het bedrijfsleven afkomt een mythe. How we talk about the public sector has been very boring. <laughs> And because it's been boring, it's created these myths of the state at best needed just to facilitate, to incentivize, to subsidize, to create the conditions, to level the playing field. And then all the really cool, dynamic, creative stuff happens in business. So if you actually look at those places in the world that have actually achieved what we call today smart innovation-led growth, what those places have required was a very strategic, active, mission-oriented, dynamic, entrepreneurial state. And the private sector only came in later. You had Google's algorithm, you know, financed directly through the National Science Foundation. Um, you had the Navy being very important for, you know, GPS. Anyway, you can just say, you know, go on and on. And you just see that the important technological changes, which actually then allowed, if you want, uh, the private sector to surf a massive wave of publicly financed technology, is a story that we don't hear about, right? So this 800-page book, wonderful book, which I really enjoyed, even my kids have read it, on Steve Jobs, not one page, not one paragraph, not one sentence, not one word on the publicly funded technology, which of course, you know, Apple as a wonderfully innovative organization was able to put these different technologies together in a very interesting way by paying attention to design, simplicity, these wonderful calligraphy courses that Steve Jobs took, we know were very important in his own ability to think interestingly, but why is the narrative, why is the story, the discourse about Apple, Steve Jobs, or today Elon Musk, missing this key point of the role of the public sector? One of the dangers we have today is that by not putting pressure on business also to play a greater role, and in some ways it's been free riding off these public investments, we've actually in some ways allowed the business sector, for example, to become increasingly financialized. So not even doing its part. Mm -hmm. What is its part? Its part would be investing in the D of research and development, R&D, right? Research and development, the D part. Uh, needs you know proper money. It needs an active role. It needs uh, profits to be reinvested. What we have today in the U.S. is massive hoarding, so close to two trillion dollars being hoarded by the business sector, so not being reinvested. Uh, in Europe, it's it's close, I think, to 1.7 um, trillion, so also very high money not being spent. Uh, we also have an ultra financialized business sector, often spending more in share buybacks to boost their stock price to boost stock options, to boost executive pay, rather than research and development. So there's really a crisis on both sides. We have an austerity-driven government, worried, timid, not playing this visionary role it used to play, and we have an ultra-financialized private sector. Hoe zorg je ervoor dat het bedrijfsleven niet alleen profiteert van in overheidshandel ontwikkelde technologie, maar dat er ook iets van de opbrengst terugvloeit. In Denemarken hebben ze daar een oplossing voor bedacht. De overheid heeft er een eigen investeringsfonds, het Danish Growth Fund, dat aandelen koopt in Deense start-ups. We have invested uh, sinds the inception of, uh, of the Danish Growth Fund uh, approximately 2 billion euro's in in some 6000 companies and and we expect to do some three to four hundred million euros this year in eight, nine hundred companies. Een van de bedrijfjes waar het Danish Growth Fund in investeerde is Universal Robots. Esmen Östergaard is een van de oprichters. Hij ontwikkelde een revolutionaire robotarm die heel makkelijk te gebruiken is. It's a new kind of robot, so it's more a robot which is supposed to be a tool for people to use rather than this big machine behind a fence that steals people's jobs. And did the idea immediately take off? The idea took off, but it took three years to make the robot. 
So that was a lot of work. And we, we spent all the money we got. Mm -hmm. We ran out of money. We spent some more money. We got a loan. We spent that. And then we had absolutely no more money. And we were pretty desperate. Well, we came across these two uh, young guys uh, in 2007. They were visiting another company at the university called Escape. And uh, they also walked into our office. Maybe at that time it was like a 50-50 thing, if it would survive or not. I guess we invested first time in, in eight, um, um, an amount of um, two million euros. The company grew in size. The critical phase was to get to a sales volume where the numbers were actually, so you make black numbers on the bottom, not red numbers anymore. Yeah. And uh, that happened at around 20 robots per month. And then we exited, uh, divested uh, the company here in, in, in this spring. We sold the company in May to Teradyne, a big US company. So now they own you know, robots. We, we got our money back 50 times on the cash deal alone. So, um, uh, so we got back uh, some 100 million euros uh, on the cash deal and then on top of this comes an earn out. Yeah, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. I would say there's a, there will be a lot of private investors that will be uh, certainly, certainly, envious. certainly they envy this sort of um, this sort of investments. But it's a lot of money they got out of it. Was there a big celebration around the office? Mm, oh yeah, sure, sure. As we have just earned a enormous profit on Universal Robots, 100 million euros, it'll all go back into new companies. Hundreds, maybe, of new universal robots. So, but it doesn't flow back into the state no. coffers? No. It doesn't go back to no. the uh, Ministry of Finance? Who no. Can... It's recirculating, it's recirculating. So, these years we are profitable and we will, of course, uh, put aside some money for, uh, for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. um, but then we will invest the rest into new companies and um, make sure that um, it grows. The best we can hope for is really that some of the other private investors, they do like we do in the future. So in the end, we will be obsolete and we can hand over the key uh, to the treasury and say, hey, mission completed. Uh, we created um, 10,000 companies, um, 100,000 jobs, uh, and here's the profit and the key. Voor Matsukato is een overheid die voldoende geld terugkrijgt om te blijven innoveren nog maar de helft van de oplossing. Zij ziet in Denemarken nog iets waardoor het land de afgelopen jaren bovenin de lijstjes met meest innovatieve landen staat. En dat doet haar denken aan vroeger. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. What I love about that speech is that he basically argues that it's important to dream. It's important to be crazy in some ways. And just think of Steve Jobs' speech. You know, be hungry, be foolish, be crazy. It's mixing the two, right? In other words, we're only going to get big things to happen when both the public and the private sector are allowed to dream, think big, think about future missions. Ambitieuze ideeën en een lange termijn visie zijn de afgelopen decennia schaars geworden in de politiek. Maar Martin Liedegaard, voormalig minister van Energie in Denemarken, kreeg het voor elkaar. The vision of Denmark is to become completely fossil free in 2050. I would like to see Denmark out of fossil fuels in 10 years in the energy sector. Such an agreement where you involve the whole energy sector and you have the whole parliament, practically speaking, behind you and the industry and the green organizations is of course a very big maneuver. It took two years to prepare and negotiate it. 
and it was hard to do it, I can tell you. But the good things are that everybody is on board now. Met een combinatie van nieuwe technologie op het gebied van energiebesparing en de inzet van veel windenergie, probeert Denemarken met verenigde krachten de ambitieuze doelen te halen. We are right now on 42% uh, in the energy, but when it comes to power production, we are on uh, 50-55%. In Denmark, a few years ago, they decided that by 2050, the whole economy has to be fossil fuel free. Now, is that the kind of Kennedy-like, man on the moon-like big vision that you're looking for? Yes, absolutely, for two reasons. First of all, it's concrete. You'll know if you've achieved it or not. Some challenges, like aging, it's not clear, you know, what, you know, what does that mean? So a mission-oriented challenge should be broad enough that it goes beyond just a sector, right? But also concrete enough that you know when you've gotten there, so you can start worrying if you're too far away. I will fight to keep that ambitious level because I'm pretty sure it's good for climate, but it's definitely also good for the industry. The other reason that it's, it's good is precisely that it requires lots of different sectors to interact. I've been actually a critic of some industrial policies that have come out recently, including the top sector approach in Holland, or the key sector approach in the UK, because you know, what does it mean to say you know, automobiles, aerospace, creative industries, finance? You know, what do you want those sectors to do? So having a much more sort of problem-oriented uh, mission, which then kind of requires lots of different sectors, you know, about 14 different sectors were required to go to the moon, including innovation and clothing, right, and textiles. Um, those are very interesting because it, it produces a kind of dynamism. And in fact, the kind of dynamism we have today in places like Denmark are extraordinary. If you don't have a stable and long-term political framework, it's very hard to move investments and innovation in the private sector. Uh, the other way around, if we don't, as politicians, listen to the demands and the requirements from the private sector, take them seriously, uh, then we can't expect them to make the investments. The public sector is best at making stability. That's what we can do politically, whereas the private sector is the best one to make the the concrete solutions, uh, find the technologies most efficient and appropriate, and make the innovation. Not only has this mission enabled, allowed, fostered really interesting kind of manufacturing level policies, where they're literally the number one in the world for both solar and wind, especially if you look at it per capita, um, they also have become, for example, Denmark has become the number one provider of high-tech services to China's green economy. I mean, how cool is that? There's no doubt that to be a first mover uh, in such a big area as energy uh, gives you a lot of advantages when it comes to innovation and new patents. And if you look at who's actually taking the patents in this area, in Europe, you will find that, that our small country has got an exceptional high rate of the patents and the innovation that is taking place in, in Europe. Uh, and that, that, of course, takes investments. There has just been a tradition for politicians who dare to say, we actually want to move our societies in a specific direction. We know we have a climate challenge. We know that it will be our generation who will deal with it if we should solve it. And that's why we need to say we want to move our societies in that direction. The real key point in my work is how to make capitalism functional, how to create public-private partnerships that are mutualistic and not parasitic, and how to ensure that we set up the contracts, literally the deal between public and private institutions, so that we can actually do these great things again and again and again and again and again and again. Kijk de lange aflevering op onze website. Of bekijk deze twee andere video's van Tegenlicht Kort. Iedere week op de hoogte blijven van Tegenlicht Kort, abonneer je dan op ons kanaal.